Dr. Michael Brown will now give APSA's Lasker Foundation Award Lecture. Dr. Brown is Paul J. Thomas, Professor of Molecular Genetics and Director of the Johnson Center for Molecular Genetics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. Dr. Brown, along with Joseph Goldstein, share many awards, including the Nobel Prize for Medicine or Physiology for their discovery of and work with the LDL receptor. Please help me welcome Dr. Michael Brown. Thank you. Um, I know the hour is late, and I will try to let you all get the dinner on time. Um, the title of this talk is uh, Why Prizes? And it should be obvious to you by now that we scientists love to award prizes to ourselves. <laughs> At this brief two-day meeting, we're awarding prizes, we're awarding ourselves four prizes. The Korsmeyer Prize, which you've just heard about, the, the Cobra Medal, the Harrington Prize, and the Selden Smith Award. Indeed, I'm presenting this lecture only because I once received the Lasker Award. And the lecture is sponsored by the young physician scientists of the APSA. And some of them hope to win a prize someday. <laughs> so I dedicate this lecture to them. And the question I pose is, do scientific awards have any value? Do they further the cause of science? Or do they simply provide cash and an impressive line on a CV, a medal to collect dust on a shelf, or a fancy certificate to hang on a wall. In the next few minutes, I'd like to tell you why I think scientific prizes are justified. But let's begin with two things that science prizes are not. First, they are not goals. They differ from Olympic medals or Super Bowl rings. In sports, the goal is to win the prize. If you don't finish first, you're a loser. In science, the goal is to, to discover truth. Prizes are a pleasant afterthought. Some scientists confuse science with sports. They choose a trendy field and plan their experiments with a goal to win a prize. If I can solve the next problem in this field, I'm sure to win a Nobel Prize. These scientists compete to publish in high-profile journals where their work will be closely, will be widely viewed and may even elicit a commentary. They flock to endless scientific meetings with the same crowd where they expand their contacts and polish their profiles. I pity these outwardly driven scientists. They lack an internal reward system and they depend only on the approval of others. Even if they make a fundamental discovery, they consider themselves failures if their discovery is not recognized with a major prize. Other scientists are inwardly driven. Their passion, their passion is to answer a question that burns inside of them, even if no one considers this question important. The inwardly driven scientist cannot rest without finding the answer. The answer always leads to more questions, and so inwardly driven scientists pursue the problem ever deeper. Eventually, they reach a fundamental level where the previously uninteresting uh, uh, task has implications that extend much further than the original problem, and this is their reward. Recent examples include the obscure bi bacteriologists working in a in a yogurt factory who were puzzled by repeat sequences in bacterial genomes, later to find that they were the bacterial immune system. This work led to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology that is revolutionizing animal genetics. Other inwardly directed scientists studied the circadian rhythm of pupil hatching in fruit flies, the reproductive practices of hermaphroditic worms, or the molecular basis of fluorescence in jellyfish. All of this obscure work led to profound biologic insights and powerful new technologies. Here's another thing that prizes are not. They are not declarations of genius, despite what the public thinks. Prizes recognize the discovery, not the discoverer. 
The selection committee first decides whether a discovery is significant enough to merit a prize. Then they try to identify the scientist who made the discovery. Contrary to popular belief, the jury makes no statement about the intelligence or even the creativity of the discoverer. They state simply that he or she has contributed to an important discovery. It's true that most prize-winning scientists are above average in intelligence, but only a few are near the top. The Nobel Foundation maintains a book of signatures by all previous Nobel laureates. Signing the same book as Albert Einstein does not make one an Einstein. <laughs> Fortunately, most Nobel Prize winners have a relative who brings them back down to earth. I hope you can read the caption. <laughs> it was just that one time that you won the Nobel Prize, wasn't it, dear? <laughs> There's another complication. Mo many prizes limit the recipients to three. The Nobel Foundation began this arbitrary practice many years ago. As scientific fields have expanded, revolutionary discoveries often result from efforts by many scientists. In such case, cases, the prize must be delayed until some of the scientists die, <laughs> reducing the number to three. To win a scientific prize, you must outlive your competitors. <laughs> so if competition for prizes creates false motives for scientists and false interpretations for the public, why do we have them? In my opinion, prizes are beneficial because they show the world that society values scientific discovery. When the President of the United States welcomes American Nobel Prize laureates to the White House, he elevates scientists to nearly the same status as NCAA basketball champions. <laughs> Such publicity may inspire young people to realize that science is valued. Of course, we must temper this ambition by explaining that they must first discover something. Fame is an afterthought, not a goal. Another benefit of scientific prizes is that they immortalize the name of the grantor. Without his prize, Albert Nobel might be remembered as the inventor of dynamite. And Albert Lasker would be the advertising genius who caused the phrase, lucky strikes mean fine tobacco. Last year, we established the Selden Smith Award to immortalize two giants of medicine of the 20th century, Donald Selden of Dallas and Holly Smith of San Francisco. While we're on the subject of prizes, I'll now spend a few minutes to tell you about a remarkable series of prizes that may inspire an audience of young physician scientists. I'm speaking about the golden decade of medical Nobel laureates. The golden decade of medical, of medical Nobel laureates extended from 1964 to 1972. Nine physicians who trained at the National Institutes of Health in this nine-year period went on to receive Nobel Prizes. This is truly remarkable. No other training institution has ever produced so many Nobel laureates in so short a period. All nine of these trainees had MD degrees, and eight of the nine had residency training. Let me briefly describe these nine physician scientists and their discoveries. The first to receive this honor were Joe Goldstein and me. I was born in New York and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. In marked contrast, Joe was born in Kings Tree, South Carolina, a cotton belt town of 3,000 people. I used to think Kings Tree was the middle of nowhere. Then I visited it, and I realized the middle of nowhere is a defined place. <laughs> it, it's, it's the middle of nowhere. King's Tree is off to the side of the middle of nowhere, somewhere. <laughs> Somehow, Joe prospered in King's Tree all the way through high school. He graduated from UT Southwestern Medical School in 1966, and we met as medicine interns at the Massachusetts General Hospital. After our residencies, both of us became research fellows at the NIH. 
And we also had clinical duties. We cared for two children who were having heart attacks, a brother and a sister who were having heart attacks because their LDL levels were 10 times above normal. After moving to Texas, we set out to determine the cause of this hypercholesterolemia, and we discovered LDL receptors and the process of receptor-mediated endocytosis. Our work established the scientific foundation for statins in the prevention of heart attacks, and more recently for anti-PCSK9 therapy for severe hypercholesterolemia. The next NIH trainees to win the prize were Mike Bishop and Harold Varmus, one from Old York and the other from New York. After medicine residencies at Mass General and Columbia, Mike and Harold became scientific partners at UCSF, where they conducted brilliant experiments to demonstrate that human cells contain their own oncogenes. They don't require delivery by viruses. Their discovery overturned dogma and set the stage for, for our entire modern understanding of cancer. Alfred G. Gilman was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and unfortunately he died this past December in Dallas, Texas. Al's middle initial G stands for Goodman. In 1941, Al's father, Alfred Gilman Sr., and his good friend, Louis Goodman, produced a classic textbook of pharmacology known universally as Goodman and Gilman. In the same year, the senior Gilman had a son, and he gave him the middle name of Goodman in honor of his partner. So Alfred Goodman Gilman has the distinction of being the only person ever named for a textbook. Al discovered G proteins, which couple cell surface receptors to internal signaling cascades. His work explains how hormones and many drugs act and has it's influenced all of medicine. By the way, the G in G proteins does not stand for Gilman or Goodman. It stands for GTP, the activator of G proteins. Unlike the previous laureates, Stanley Prusner was not born on the East Coast. Even at birth, Stanley never followed the crowd. And those of you who know him know it's true today. After graduating from Penn Medical School, Stan did a residency in neurology at UCSF, and he became fascinated with a degenerative brain disease that was thought to be caused by a hypothetical slow virus. Having trained at NIH in biochemistry, Prusner used biochemical methods to purify the virus that caused this disease. Instead of a virus, he isolated a single protein that causes the disease by forming ag aggregates. His revolutionary discovery was that these aggregated proteins set up a chain reaction. One aggregated protein acts as a template, causing its normal counterpart to aggregate, and the chain reaction is propagated. Even more revolutionary was the discovery that these aggregates could be transmitted from one animal to another. Prusner had discovered a new form of infection, a transmissible agent that doesn't require DNA or RNA. Despite the enormous skepticism that met his discovery, it's now completely validated. Indeed, the prion mechanism appears to explain many neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Farid Murad, like Al Gilman, received MD and PhD degrees from Case Western Reserve, which had the first MD-PhD program in the country. He did his residency in medicine at the Mass General. He made the astounding discovery that nitric oxide, a gas, can act as a signaling molecule in blood vessels. He showed that nitric oxide activates guanylate cyclase, dilating the vessel. Murad's discovery was also greeted with skepticism, but soon it became established fact. Like all of the Nobel discoveries, Murad's discovery had broad implications for medicine, but Murad's had a special significance for some of us. His discovery led directly to Viagra. <laughs> Richard Axel was born in New York, and he's been there ever since except for four years in medical school at Johns Hopkins. At, gradu at graduation, the dean told Richard that he would receive his degree on the condition that he never practice on living people. 
So Richard did his residency in pathology at Columbia. There, the head pathologist told Richard that he would never be allowed to practice pathology on dead people. <laughs> so Richard has the distinction of being the only physician who was ever prohibited from practicing either on the living or the dead. <laughs> Axel's Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of the superfamily of odorant receptors and for brilliantly showing how the chemical information the chemical information in an odor is translated into spatial information in the brain. Axel and his students made many other contributions to science. For example, they invented the technique for in transfecting plasmids into mammalian cells, which led to the discovery of the first cancer-causing mutations in humans. He also discovered CD4, the receptor that the AIDS virus uses to enter T cells. Robert Lefkowitz is the most recent inductee into the Nobel Club. Born in the Bronx, Robert graduated from Columbia Medical School and did a residency in the same place. After leaving the NIH, Bob devoted his entire scientific career to the cell surface receptors that activate Gilman's G proteins. He, purified, he pursued the problem doggedly over a 30-year period, culminating in the purification and cloning of the beta adrenergic receptor. Along the way, he elucidated the kinetic principles that govern receptor behavior. As a result of Bob's work, GPCRs are now recognized as the target for many drugs and neurotransmitters. They're at the very heart of medicine. The nine physician scientists took convergent routes to nobility. They started out at six different medical schools. They converged on three residency programs and then on one research institution. What made these physicians converge on the NIH and what magic spell did the NIH cast? A major factor was the Vietnam War. In the 1960s, all medical residents were sub subject to the military draft and many were sent to the jungles of Vietnam. There were only a few ways to avoid this fate. One was to be accepted as a research associate at the National Institutes of Health. As you can imagine, the competition was intense. The nine Nobel laureates had all compiled outstanding medical school records, and thus they converged on the most prestigious residencies. This prestige qualified them for the NIH. Five of the laureates had significant research experience prior to the NIH. Two even had MD, PhD degrees. In contrast, in very sharp contrast, Joe and I, Harold Varmus, and Bob Lefkowitz had done very little, if any, science. I firmly believe that all nine of us would have undertaken research careers even if there were no Vietnam War and no NIH. How we, however, we would not have converged on one institution and we would not have been as successful. In the 1960s, the NIH was populated with brilliant scientists, an equal mix of MDs and PhDs. Some worked on medically related problems, but many conducted pure basic research. As young MDs, we were all too familiar with the uncertainties in medicine. We were frustrated by complex clinical problems that lacked clear-cut explanations. At the NIH, we bathed in a shining sea of pure thought. The approach was reductionist. Complex problems were reduced to fundamental mechanisms. At, net, at NIH, all nine of us were trained in biochemistry. We were adept at working with proteins. We took this deep biochemical background with us when we left the NIH, and it became the Rosetta Stone for our future discoveries. We were fortunate that two technical advances arose early in our careers. One was tissue culture. We could study human cells like the previous generation studied rats. The second was molecular biology. Suddenly, we could manipulate genes and read the genetic code. Our biochemical training prepared us to take advantage of these new disciplines. One more point should be relevant to young physician scientists. After we began our independent research careers, five of us continued to play clinical roles. I was trained in gastroenterology. Joe and I made attending rounds at Parkland Hospital for 15 years. We stopped only after we received the Nobel Prize. 
became actually uncomfortable to attend. Um, I can tell you stories, but <laughs> <laughs> the distractions became too great. Farid Murad became chief of medicine at Stanford's VA hospital. Bob Lefkowitz was a practicing cardiologist at Duke for many years, and Stan Prusner was an attending neurologist. I've emphasized Nobel Prize winners because the Nobel Prize is shorthand for significant accomplishment. But don't forget how I began this talk. Prizes are not goals. Many MDs and PhDs trained at NIH and went on to make equally profound discoveries. They just happened not to be recognized by a committee of mortals sitting around a table in Stockholm. The scientifically trained MDs formed the core of many departments in our finest medical schools. They too are proud of their discoveries and they owe a great debt to the training they received at the NIH. Will it ever happen again? In a nine year period, will a single institution ever train nine physicians who later receive Nobel Prizes? I doubt it. Medical schools have changed. In the 1960s, basic science was the core of medical education. We spent two years studying normal and deranged physiology. The brightest medical students were challenged to improve medicine by discovering fundamental principles. Now medical schools have condensed science courses to a few brief months. They focus on a few disease-related facts with no attention to where these facts came from or that facts will change as science advances. The joy of finding new facts or overturning old ones is no longer transmitted to students. Clinical departments have expanded geometrically as medical schools compete with private hospitals for lucrative insurance contracts. Once physician scientists formed the core of internal medicine departments, now they've been diluted to the point of irrelevance. No wonder that few medical students are choosing careers in research. The emphasis of NIH has also changed. Emphasis on translational research relegates laboratory scientists to a back burner. Individual, inwardly directed, curiosity-driven scientists have been replaced by huge consortia. We imagine that vast amounts of correlative data will somehow answer life's fundamental questions. Given all of these challenges, I doubt that the brightest medical students will ever converge on a single institution where they stimulate each other and where they are inspired by brilliant mentors. It may not happen again, but it sure was fun while it lasted. Thank you. <laughs>